Reading from the NIV, it'll be later preaching from the ESV. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to locate, was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we have both access, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. During this election year, it has been very discouraging to see how divided we are as a country. I think of the divided states of America when I think of what we should call ourselves these days. Unfortunately, I don't believe that the results of the election are going to draw us together any better. Whoever wins can say they're going to bring healing, but if the other side does not cooperate, we'll still remain divided. I hope you were able to get the voter guides um, on the table, or if you got the electronic co copies I sent yesterday, because I believe the best we can do as believers is take the personalities out. You know, in high school, you voted for the class, the class president based on who you liked as a person. You didn't care about issues. I think the issues are very important, and we need to think that. So we provide those voter guides and ask that you prayerfully consider how you will uh, respond. In addition to continued prayer for the election, I want to remind you to pray for the vote that will happen this coming week for Amy Comey Barrett as uh, a Supreme Court justice, Lord willing. First, it seemed like everybody was against her, but when they got to hear her, she proved herself rather astute in everything that she did. One of the things I loved about what she said in, in one of the questions would help us all as we think about a have, how to have unity. She said whenever she was writing her opinion after a case, she tried to read it from the perspective of the losing side so that they would look at that and say, well, do they, is there something here for them to latch on to to say, I understand. I wish it were the other way, but I understand. That's a great way to think about communicating. Don't just think to make your, nose, your thoughts known and, and seek to be understood. Think about what other people are thinking. Seek to understand where they are coming from. So I, I just think that's a challenge at this time. And this morning as we talk about our corporate testimony as a church, I felt it was okay to talk about the, our nation in, in the divisions. I don't know that I have hope for the nation, but I have hope for the church because there's a spirit of God living in all people that are part of a true church, and, and he can draw us together. Every church I've been a part of has had a corporate testimony of some sort. They were known for something. The church I attended growing up was a very loving church, a lot of family members that I knew, so it felt loving to me. Um, but I've said many times, there were times when they taught about the Bible in a way that denied God's power. So the one example I remember is, you know, that the feeding of the 5,000 wasn't a miracle as much as it was that they saw the little boy sharing his food and everybody who had actually brought food put it out. That's why it all, we were able to feed all those people. Now, I, I don't know if that was emphasized, but I remember that being put out. And I'm thinking, no, my God fed those people. And so that was kind of how I remember my church loving, but needing to, to, to really 
hold on to the power of God in a better way. The church I attended during my internship was also a loving church, um, but they were a little wary of outsiders. Uh, at least I felt that way. I came in as a, somebody to, to do an inter- internship and work with the youth group, and I had not been baptized as a believer yet. I was sprinkled as an infant. I, didn't, I wasn't a believer when I was sprinkled. Um, so I, it's not so much the mode, but I knew that I needed to be baptized as a believer. This was the first church I was attending regularly uh, a- after leaving high school and so forth that, that had a baptismal. And I said, would you baptize me? And people said, well, why do you want to be baptized? Uh, because God asked me to be. And, and they, they said, well, we just want to make sure you don't think you're going to get a job here. No, I just want to be baptized. And, and, and that was fine. I, I understand. That, you know, I was a young kid, and I may have projected something that made them wonder about me. Who knows? Um, the first church I worked at full-time, very strong missions-minded church. They had uh, a, a couple of mission organizations in the area, and a lot of people were there really helping us to, to focus. And, and missions that were really hard, a lot of the 1040 window missionaries, uh, really focusing on the hardest, some of the hardest place to be. All, all missions is challenging, but so I love that. But I've shared that story. Two weeks after I arrived at that church, people came to my house and told me why the pastor had to go. And, and I was in the midst of a, of, of a two and a half year uh, tension. People wanted the pastor to go. And I had nothing to do with it because my job was to support him. So that was one thing I remember about that church. And then the second thing is when the new pastor came in, it wasn't much better at first for me anyway and I wound up leaving. The second church I worked at full-time was missions-minded, very strong in music, and they loved their pastor. They really loved their pastor. Even people that disagreed with him loved him. Uh, there was some legalistic parts of that church that the pastor was trying to break through, but they, they just loved, they loved him very much, and I, I loved working with him. And then when I think of Bethel, here we go, I'm going to lay it all out. Ready? No. I, uh, the one thing I realized is there are seasons of testimony. We were known as something at one point, maybe now we're known as something else, and we need to keep moving on. Um, we know we started as a Sunday school, really strong in the children's ministry. At one point, we had the biggest Awana club in the area. We know that missions has been a strong part of this church as well. We know that the music, we used to have the two baby grands here, and as we made the transition, I think made a, a good transition because there are a lot of churches that fought hard about just going from organ to praise team. And we, we of course, use blended and seek to, to respect both gifts to the church because the hymns are awesome and so are the of choruses. So I, I just see seasons. But the one thing we need to be praying about is what are we going to look like going forward? COVID-19 shut us down. Things that maybe we should have shut down on our own. So as we pray about what we are to put back into our church uh, goals and our vision, we, we need to, to come together in unity. That will not always be easy because some people, this is so important to me, but we feel the Lord is saying that shouldn't be important to us as a church anymore. So we need to be praying for those things. What's our testimony going to be like until the Lord comes? And that's, that's something that I want you to, to, to be praying with me. I know as a pastor, a pastor of this church, I am so blessed to be able to bring the word to you regularly. And, and also, last week, I was part of a, a, a officiated at a wedding. Uh, we congratulate Jason and Jerry, Joe, and, and the, their union. And we just, that's just exciting. Today, uh, at the beginning of the next service, we're going to have the baptism. That's always a joy. Next week, communion, the holiday things coming up. There's just so many ways that we can come together and proclaim a corporate testimony about what's important. No matter what happens in the election, we're following the King of Kings, and we need to let people know that. So we have challenges, but we have the call to go forward in unity. And and I hope that we don't forget the importance of coming together. We're going to hear testimonies. Two weeks ago, we had a a couple of testimonies for different things. It's great to hear what individuals have to say. Today, we're focusing more on what we are as a church. And I, and I pray that this encourages you. My proposition for the morning then, God's plan of salvation includes bringing believers together. He doesn't just save you and say, oh, good, go on until we see you in heaven. He said, go, you're part of a body of believers. Now, some people, 
The best way to reflect that, I believe, is in a local church, but there are other ways to do it. We're all part of the universal body of Christ if we have the Spirit of God in us. So, so we just see that, but we need to know the plan of salvation includes bringing believers together, and we need to see that. So we're going to look at Ephesians 2 and look at some of the theological basis for this unity. We can talk about the practicalities of it all we want, but make sure we have the foundation of why we should be coming together and why we believe we can come together. Before we go any further, let me bow again in a word of prayer. I thank you, Father. I thank you for your love. I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for your plan to save individuals and then place them into the family of God, to place them into the body of Christ, to place them into the building that is the dwelling place for your spirit. I thank you that each of us have the indwelling spirit, but together, where two or three are gathered, you are there present with us in a unique way. I pray that we would learn those blessings and we would walk in those blessings. Thank you, Father, for what you will do and how you will teach us at this time. I pray that you'll have mercy on me, a sinner, that nothing I am or say or even think will get in the way of the message that your Spirit has for us today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I, I didn't read in the Scripture reading in verse 11. I'll back up to that. Ephesians 2, verse 11, through the first part of verse 12. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. First thing I want you to see about our union is unity is that all non-believers are separated from Christ. All non-believers are separated from Christ. This is talking about a distinction between Gentile and Jew, but both Gentiles and Jews need a Savior. As I, the more I read this, th th there is a, a, a part that we want to learn about how Gentiles are brought, and that's actually going to be emphasized in chapter 3, and next week we'll talk about that. This, I just want you to see the separation from Christ. See, the Jews thought that they were great because they had this physical sign of circumcision that they belong to God. But when their Messiah came, they rejected him, and they remained unsaved. So we have to see that both Gentiles and Jews need a Savior because all those that are non-believers are still separated from God and Christ. So we see, look at uh, the middle part of verse 12. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise. Now, I will say this, both Gentiles and Jews need God's promises. Both Gentiles and Jews need God's promises. Jews, Orthodox Jews may say, my relationship with God is based on all the things I do, all the things I do in his name and all the, all the laws and all the traditions that I seek to follow. But that's not their relationship with God. It just makes them feel good. But the fact is we need, we need God's promises really understand. And I don't want to take too much time, but whenever I saw the covenants, I said, I want to go through this again and just study this just quickly. Because many times people in the church will say, I don't really understand the Old Testament. I don't want to get into the Old Testament. Well, you're missing. You're missing out. Because you may not see, well, that doesn't apply to me, but it teaches you about who your uh, God is, who your creator is. So if you learn how he treated the Israelites, you will learn how, why he does thing, certain things toward you. So I just want to go through the covenants. Uh, just briefly, there's seven of them, and, I, and I'm just going to read a couple of, uh, name the covenant, and, and just read a verse about it. The covenant with Adam after the fall came in Genesis 3.15. I did a summary there because I couldn't fit it on the slide. The seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. The serpent who deceived the woman would be crushed by the seed, the offspring of the woman. That's the beginning of God's promise making to his, to his creation. And then when Noah, when the flood came on the earth, Genesis 9, 11, the last part says, never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. There is going to be destruction on the earth, but not by flood. He promised. When was the last time you saw a rainbow? That's a sign of that promise. Then the Abrahamic covenant, um, Genesis 12, 3b, and I just want you to see, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. If the world just understood that. There's other parts to that that promise that he made in Genesis 12, it's a great passage. You go home and read it. But, you know, I will bless you. I'll, those who bless you, I will. It's just, it's just a blessing. So all the blessings that God wants to focus on the world now are going to be through the Jews. And, and that's where we see that. 
Then a little bit later, we see the promise of the land. God had promised Abraham the land as well, but, but Moses, as he was leading the people out to, uh, of Egypt, he, was going to take, he wasn't going to be able to take them in the land, but he emphasized. And in Deuteronomy, he said, you may come a time when you are scattered around the nations, but remember, this land is yours. And, and he says, he will gather you again from all the people. That has happened. That's happened twice when they went to the Babylonian captivity and they were gathered again. No, no time have you heard that. A conquered nation was allowed to return. And we see now what's building up in the promised land. He is gathering his people for the future time. So there's a land promise there. I don't know how many people want to draw up maps and give out the land. God gives out the land. And then the Mosaic Covenant, um, there's many things to say about the Mosaic Covenant, but the one thing I, I love at the end of Deuteronomy, or in Deuteronomy, is at the end of Moses' life, he said, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. And he said, if you act this way, you'll be blessed. If you act this way, you'll be cursed. And they have experienced many curses. But God still, some of, those plan, some of his promises are unconditional. The land is theirs. There will still be a kingdom. Um, and then the Davidic covenant refers to the kingdom. See, I'm setting before, I'm sorry. Uh, I think I didn't copy the right. It's a promise that, that David's throne will endure forever. I think I copied the wrong verse there. Um, but to, to understand that he promised through Moses, Abraham, Moses, da David, there's going to be a throne. And then the new covenant. And we talk about that every time we have communion. This cup is the New Testament, the new covenant. But Ezekiel has, there's, again, a lot of verses I could point out, but in Ezekiel, God says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. The new covenant involves the spirit of God living within us. So it's just the world needs to understand these promises, both Gentile and Jew. See, the Jew says they have the promises, but they've rejected so many of them. They, they don't understand them. The world, Gentile and Jew, need God's promises. Then finally, the last part of verse 12, having no hope and without God in the world. When I read that, the, the one thing I thought of was how many people, again, talking about the election. See, right now we have two types of people, some that have a completely secular outlook and do not want to acknowledge God has a claim on us in any way. We will determine what God can say to us. We will determine what's right for us. We are the center of our universe. And then there are people that recognize, no, God is. And we have to consider what God wants as a nation, surely as a church. Some, but many of our churches today are all built on the fact we just want to do whatever people want so they'll come and sit in our pews. And, and that'll make, that, that, we must be doing good ministry because we have a lot of people sitting here. No, well, are we honoring Christ? Are we honoring God? Are we, are we listening to the voice of the Spirit? That's what's important. And COVID-19 has really challenged that because our goal now isn't to get a crowd. It's, it's to minister to people and, and make connections and engage people. So we see this. So I just want you to know, don't get despondent about whatever happens in the election. You have hope not because of an election. You have hope because of God, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. His plan is going forward. If his plan is to see America take a dive real quick, that's his plan and it's a good plan. If it's to sustain some of the things we've seen recently, uh, praise the Lord, we'll see. We don't know. We will, we will know a week from Tuesday. Well, maybe a week, uh, many weeks after that. Um, all non-believers are separated from Christ. That's the first thing we all have in common. Without Christ, we're separated from God. All believers are made one. The next passage that we're going to beginning at verse uh, 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We, we, are, brought, we are made one. And, and to, because we have been brought near, all believers are made one being brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's exciting to be brought near. You ever gone to an event and you're just really, really on the outskirts and you're afraid to, to be noticed, and, and on somebody with a smiling face and, and a loving hand draws you into the group, you're brought near. Hey, be a part of with us. That's, that's a nice feeling. Well, God did that for the Gentile. He does that for anybody, brings us near to Christ. But then look at verses 14 to 15. 
For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. It's great to be brought near, but if you're brought near to someone who's totally hostile, there's a wall there. You might be standing right next to them, but if there's a wall of hostility, we need to do, do something about that. How did he do that? He broke it down through his flesh. He broke down the wall of hostility by his flesh. His body was broken for us. His blood shed so that we could be drawn near, and his body was broken so that the wall of hostility would be taken away. And let me finish. Well, there's the word abolished there. I want to point out two verses here. You can write them down. They're not in your notes. Uh, Matthew 5, 17, Jesus was teaching in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. Do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. In other words, he wasn't just going to set aside. He couldn't set them aside until he fulfilled every one of them. That's why he's the perfect sacrifice for our sin. He fulfilled them. How did he fulfill them? Well, all the law and the prophets are summed up with what? Love. He did the things that he needed to do. He challenged the things that needed to be challenged, but he did it in a loving way. Even in his judgment, he is loving. And we need to see that. And then just to, again, to Romans 10, 4, Paul, Paul wrote, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. See, the law isn't the way we find righteousness anymore. In the Abrahamic promises, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteous, righteousness. So, so we see that the wall of hostility can be broken down after we're drawn, after we're drawn close we're drawn near, we can see. We can see the wall of hostility down. But I want to take you to verses 16 and 17. Being reconciled through the cross, and might he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. All right, so we have the near and the, the hostility. How? How is he, are we reconciled? Through the cross. If we truly understand what Jesus suffered and sacrificed at the cross to forgive us and bring us close, how can we not suffer and sacrifice with other believers? It's not easy. Some people are really difficult, but we're part of the same body. And if Jesus was willing to suffer for them, are you willing to sacrifice? Or are you going to put your foot down and say, no, I want it my way or the highway? You need to learn that, that through the, the testimony of the cross, we can be reconciled, of course, to him, but also to one another because we see his example of sacrifice, of love. So all non-believers are separated from Christ. All believers are made one. Believers are blessed in our unity. Believers are blessed in our unity. We, we need to see that being together brings great, greater blessing. I, again, the church I grew up with, I didn't feel like it fed me. As far as Bible knowledge, it was through a parachurch organization and camps that I really came to know the Bible. and just understand. But, but I still needed to unite with fellow believers. Even if, even if they weren't teaching, there was a sense of, of learning about God's love through the love of other people. So look at verse 18. For, though, for through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Think about that. Having access to the Father in one spirit. How, greater is you, how much greater is your access when you are united in love with other believers? You remember the promise? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. There's, there's, imagine two a brother and sister or two brothers or two sisters, whatever, two siblings, and they're, they're, they want to make a request of a mom and dad. And they know this could be a hard request to get an, a yes to. So they get together and they kind of figure out what they can say and how we say it. They'll tag team. Well, you say this, and then you, you look sad in the eyes, and then you say this, and you, you know what kids can do to try to get their parents to give in. We have a perfectly loving he Heavenly Father. And he says, I see you coming when you come together in one spirit. And that touches him. 
He's only going to give us what is good for us anyway. He's, not, he's going to say no to some things, and that's the way it should be. But the fact is, when we come together and we, we, we're in one spirit, we have that access to talk to the Heavenly Father. That's exciting. That's a blessing that comes from the unity in the body. Look at verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We are now fellow citizens and members of God's house. You like that phrase? Doors always open. Doors always open. You're always welcome here. That's the picture here. We are citizens of heaven. We are citizens in the family of God. We're part of his household. We are welcome to come here. We need to see we need to see that. We belong. There's a sense of belonging that everybody wants to have. I heard a, a, a webinar I went to today. They said, no one imagines their, their plan for their life alone. They need to connect with others. And hopefully the church is one place where that can happen. When you're alone, and we'll see at the end, if you're alone, you might start to choose wrong uh, associates, people, friends, and they will lead you away from God. We need to see this being fellow citizens and members of God's house. And then finally, verses 20 through 22. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being to, built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is not talking about the church building. Praise the Lord for our church building. Praise the Lord for our trustees and all the, work to, all the work that they do for our building. But this is talking about us as living stones. It's not mentioned here, but other places in the New Testament it is. We are all living stones indwelt by the Spirit and brought together to be built to be a dwelling place for God. We need to see that we are part of something. And that we're built through the ages. I love this picture. We say, well, Jesus is the foundation. That's in our individual lives as we're building our works wood, hand, stubble, or, or gold, silver, silver, and precious stone. That's our individual. But this building, the foundation is the apostles and the prophets. And then Jesus is the cornerstone. And generation by generation by generation by generation, the church is being built. Now, we, again, the, the, the building isn't important. That's why Stephen got stoned. He preached the message, said, we don't need that temple anymore because we are indwelt by God by the Spirit of God. They didn't like that. They killed him for it. But we can be, we're part of something that's lasting. It's been from history, and it's going into the future, the very church of God. And I think about when, it, it, I've talked about this during COVID-19, uh, one of the things we watched when we were home, is this, uh, it's online, you can watch the, 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 the series called The Chosen. And it's about Jesus calling his disciples the chosen that were following him. And not just the 12 men, Mary Magdalene and others. Nicodemus is part of the story. It's a beautiful story. But as I watched them, I said, these guys didn't get along. They were so different. They each came from different places. And yet, when the time came for the Spirit to fall on them, they were with one purpose, and they were unified. They turned the world upside down. That's what our corporate testimony should seek to do. We, we can have our differences. We can have things that don't quite go the way we want them, but we can see what God wants to do in us and through us together. We need to see that. So my conclusion actually comes from uh, two verses I read this week in Proverbs. Again, one of the ways I'm staying sane with the election is just to keep reading the wisdom of Proverbs over and over again. Because all the things that you see in the world today, Solomon saw them and he comments on them. And he said, oh, there's nothing new under the sun. That's from his other book, Ecclesiastes. But, but to understand, that to, in, Romans, in Proverbs 18, I read this verse and it just stopped me for a moment. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. You hear what he's saying? There are times when I just want to be left alone. I just want to be left alone. But if I isolate myself, I'm going to give in more and more to my own desires, and I'm going to break out against, I'm going to stand against sound judgment or wisdom. That's a pretty powerful verse. And my conclusion is we must commit to Christian fellowship. We must commit to Christian fellowship. 
But the interesting thing is, at the end of that same chapter is this verse. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. What's that saying? Choose your friends wisely. Choose where you fellowship wisely. Are people drawing you through the power of God, through the word of God, to the power of the Spirit? Is that their focus, or is it to, to show what they are? We need to recognize you, you could choose the wrong companions and come to ruin. So my conclusion, we must commit to Christian fellowship wisely. Christian fellowship can't start until we are saved. In the next service, we're going to hear a couple of testimonies about how God reached down and got a hold of people. We, we, there are so many things that, that we at least can be in agreement that Jesus is the only sacrifice for sin, only Savior of the world. And we need to believe in what he has done for us personally. Not just know about him. Not just know, I, he was a good teacher, he did good things, and he might be the son of God. No, he is the son of God. And he is the only sacrifice for your sin. You are not getting to God, the Father, except through him. So you accept Jesus and, and know him and then recognize he wants to see us all come together as the body of Christ. That, that corporate that corporate truth that we, we need to come together, even when it's hard, even when it's hard, we need to wisely commit ourselves to Christian fellowship. That's really hard. I, somebody just told me out in the hall, someone called somebody that hasn't been here we think because of COVID, we've done our best to reach out to people. And, and the comment was, well, I'm glad somebody called me. Well, it's a two-way street. <laughs> it's a two-way street. We're doing our best. It's hard when you get over 150, 140 people trying to figure out, you know, who, who's being connected with and not. If you have a need, reach out. And if you're thinking about somebody, recently I thought about this twice. Uh, just the Lord said, make this phone call. Go offer this to your neighbor. And it was exactly what they needed. I mean, to, to see the tears in, in the one person's eyes when, when I said, can we help with this? Thank you. I'm just worn out. Listen to the voice of the Spirit. And if he prompts you to reach out to somebody, do it. And recognize it's not just for the pastors and the elders and the deacons. It's for all of us to unite that way. That's, that's our challenge this morning. Um, I'm going to have a word of prayer. We forgot to do something during announcements, so after I have the word of prayer and pronounce a benediction, um, they'll turn the, the thing off and we'll, uh, we'll do that thing that we forgot to do. Um, let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you so much for the joy that can be ours as we are one with another. I pray that you would reach out to us, help us to see how much you draw us to, to, to one another. Like any parent, you want to see your children getting along. Forgive us for when we make things that are unimportant too important. Help us to know that we need to walk together in the power of the Spirit and the truth of your word, and know that that truth will set us free to love one another and to have a testimony of love that the world will envy. If they could see unity within the church, it may help them deal with their own uh, divisions. We don't know what your plan is, but we pray for this country, but most of all, we pray for your church around this country and around the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.